right, fantastic. So thank you everyone for um, coming to see and hear about some of the things that we've been doing um, using um, mastery-based grading um, in organic chemistry at Kalamazoo College. Um, so I am uh, Dwight Williams. I am, I guess, officially titled the Roger F. and Harriet G. Varney Assistant Professor at K. Um, overall, just to put some things in a bit of a context for you, um, I've been teaching um, organic chemistry at the college level for 10 years now. My primary responsibility at K um, is in the organic chemistry one and two sequence with the lab. Um, my class sizes um, are around 48 to 60 students. Um, we're on the quarter system at Kalamazoo College. So I have two 10 week terms to um, help all of our young scholars learn everything they need to know about organic chemistry um, through these hour and 15 minute class times on Monday, Wednesday and Fridays. Um, I don't have any TAs. Um, so all of the, the coursework and prep and all that stuff is left up to me. And then I also run an undergraduate research lab with about 10 students in it each year. So like many of you, right, time is, you know, precious. So we're trying to figure out how to do things is the most efficient way as we can. Um, a little bit about Kalamazoo College. Um, we're a private liberal arts college with about 1500 students. One of the cool things about K is that each class every year around 10% of our, major, our students major in chemistry. So that sort of can change a lot of the things that we can do in our classes because a lot of the students in our room um, want to be chemists. Um, we're really big on experiential education as a part of our K plan. And then like many colleges around the country, right? Um, we are trying to increase our um, student body diversity. Um, and because of that, that also presents us with some interesting opportunities to sort of rethink how we do things um, in our classrooms to make sure that all of the students in our rooms um, have the opportunity to succeed, right? And so we're gonna talk to you a little bit about what um, we've been doing and why we started to rethink the class. But before we get into that, um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat and um, Natalie and Elliot will help us sort of figure all of those out so that when we get to the end, um, we can sort of answer as many of your questions as, as we have time for. I probably plan to go here for about 20 minutes or so. So why did I start thinking or rethinking some of my course? And so if I were to ask you probably to raise your hand if any of these um, comments were comments that you heard from students at some point in time, I'm sure that all of you um, would, would raise your hands. And so for me, um, some of them that really stood out were the, the conversations that I would consistently have regarding um, points missed on a given assignment. Um, why did I lose two points? Rewrote the same thing. Can I please have this half point back? Can I please? And so that really started to, to get to me. And so I was like, I've got to find a way to get rid of points in my class so that I don't have this um, as a barrier for me and the students. Um, in particular, also curving grades is related to this point here about I work better alone because I began to see some really, I think, unhealthy um, modes of competition in my classroom where students were unwilling um, to help each other learn this material because they felt like they were being compared to someone else. And because of that, if I do better than you, then obviously I'm going to get a better grade. So I don't want you to do as well as me. Um, so I'm not going to help you, even though I understand this pretty well. And so that was, was problematic for me. And so I was looking for ways to sort of alleviate, if not eliminate, these kinds of conversations during my office hours. And the other thing that really hit home for me was, um, as you can see, I am a, a black male um, that sort of made it through the, the academic pipeline to earn a PhD in organic chemistry and become a professor. But when I looked at my courses, um, shown here on, on the left, is my spring 2016 class and each of the grades that's highlighted here in red is a student of color in my class and you can see here just sort of intuitively that the most likely outcome for a student of color in my class was a c and that was problematic for me um, when we compare that to our majority students where the most likely grade for those students um, was a b 
And so I know personally that it can't be something inherent to me being a person of color or being a student of color that sort of relegates me to this destiny of earning a C. And so um, most likely. And so I was looking for a way to sort of see if we could close this gap between my students of color uh, and, and my majority students um, to help them all get to where it is that they wanted to go. And so you might be thinking, well, maybe what were you doing in your class, right? You should probably bring in some active learning and that kind of stuff to help these, these kinds of problems. And in fact, I, I have been, right? I've been using active learning strategies um, for a long time, the majority of my academic career, in fact. Um, so my class setup is a hybrid flipped classroom. Um, I use just-in-time teaching, concept mapping, um, think, pair, share, all those kinds of things. So my class setup is before they come to class, they have to read their textbook. They watch a brief video that I post. There's an online warm-up quiz that they take. And that sort of helps me frame, okay, what is it that I'm going to talk about for the first five to 10 minutes in class? And then in class, I use Pogo-ish activities. I'm not a pure Pogo follower. So it, for the pro, pure Pogo followers out there, don't hold it against me. Um, but I, I do use group work activities to sort of help students in their learning, right? And so all of this is rooted in the idea of Bloom's taxonomy, right? We want you to learn some things, be able to recall them, and then ultimately be able to create some knowledge on your own, or at the very least at the undergraduate level, be able to evaluate um, problems, right? And then the grading in my class was pretty standard, right? I have quizzes, exams, homework. They are based out of some point value. And then at the end, the number of points that you earn, whatever percentage that is of the points that were offered, that's, that's your final grade. And so, and looking at all of these things that I was doing in terms of how we deliver the content to students, um, that really only left grading as the only thing left for me to modify or change in terms of helping close these gaps with students, perhaps change the conversations um, in my office hours and recenter things on, on learning. And so that's what we did, right? I, I was talking to my colleagues in the hallway and looking um, in the literature, and I came across this idea of assessment of learning versus assessment for learning. And I would guess that most of us want to be in this assessment for learning model. Um, and we'll go through a couple of examples, right? So here in this, this first idea, Right? How often is it that you see a student, you know, they get their assignment back, they look and they say, oh, I got eight out of 10 or six out of 10 um, or whatever it is that they got. They put it in their bag and then they're off to the next races and they keep moving forward, but they don't do sort of the metacognition to evaluate what it is that they missed to help them actually move forward in a productive way um, the next time. And so I was looking for a way to combat that, right? And then I already mentioned sort of the unhealthy um, competitive aspects of my classroom. And so I was looking for a way to address that. And it looks like assessment for learning um, can help me address that as well. And then lastly, um, a lot of those comments in my office hours, I began to think of as being externally focused. Um, and so a colleague of mine says, that many of our students think that learning is something that is done to them instead of something that they do for themselves, right? And so I wanted a way to help students realize that learning is something that you do for yourself, right? Like I don't learn it for you, I help you learn it for yourself. And so all of those ideas really help me think that this assessment for learning is the way to go, but then I didn't know how to do it. Like, how do I do that? Right. And so, like many of you, I am strapped for time. Right. Um, all the things that we have to do as faculty members. And then I got a little dude at home that I got to take care of with my wife. And so I read three books like that was it. I was like, I'm going to commit to reading these three books to figure out if they can help me sort this out. And so um, I have been talking to my colleagues about getting rid of points in my class for a long time. Um, and figuring out a way to get rid of points so that that was no longer an issue. So I read that this text for that reason. And then specifications grading um, was also presented as an idea 
or a format that might also help me get at this assessment for learning um, model. And so I am using um, mastery and specifications grading sort of interchangeably, but they do have some subtle differences. And so if you want to know more about that, you can, you can definitely dig into the literature to find out what um, those differences are, but I'm using them interchangeably. And so we set out on this, this mastery based idea. And so if you're unfamiliar with what mastery is, the way that I like to think about it, which is rooted in this quote um, from George Evans, is that mastery allows us to account for the difference in rate of learning for a given individual, right? It might take me a day to learn something, but it might take you two days. And so um, this approach allows us to account for that rate difference in our learning. And so it looks something like this in my class, right? So we're gonna learn about some stuff in class. We're gonna practice it in class. You'll make some mistakes in class. We'll address those in class. And then we will assess your knowledge of this particular skill. And one of two things can then happen, right? You can either demonstrate mastery, right? You can get all the things correct, or you can make some mistakes, at which point you then sort of enter into this cycle where we sort of repeat, right? You're gonna ask me for some help. We're gonna help you. We're gonna analyze what it is that you're doing wrong, do some more practice, then reassess, and then you either go through this loop again or you, you demonstrate mastery, right? And so it's this iterative loop that allows us to adjust for the rate at this point um, in our learning cycle, if you will. And so what my classroom looks like now, um, the format for my class hasn't changed at all. I still use all the same pogo activities that I, that I made. I still do all of the flame flip lectures that I used before, all of that stuff stays the same. The only thing I changed is how I assess your knowledge. So now I have 19 total assessments. Um, they are marked on these four levels, E, P, N, or U. And every student can reassess all of these assessments up to four times throughout the, the 10 week term. Something that I think is interesting for my class is that homework is required, but I don't grade it, right? It's something that you have to do to help you um, build the connections if you if you heard our speaker this morning right build the connections and strengthen those connections through uh your neurons you've got to do the homework you've got to practice so you got to do it but it doesn't calculate into your your final grade um in any way but it is determined mostly by your combination of e's p's n's and u's that you get on these 19 assessments and then the final exam is cumulative and it is point based um, and that it serves purely as a modifier in my class. So if you get um, a 70 or above, you get a B plus, for example. If you get a 69 to 50, you get a B minus. And then if you score below a 50, you, um, your base grade is lowered by one letter grade. And so this reason, uh, the reason I did this was to um, encourage the the long-term learning of this material right so you can't just demonstrate mastery once you got to retain it throughout the term and so in my class here what my assessments look like we'll talk about this a little bit later um, but what we really want you to focus on here is that they are all rooted in number of mistakes that you make on a given assessment that's it right so on this assessment um, if you want to be marked as an expert you've got to do everything correctly um, if you want to persist proficient, you can make up to three mistakes and then a novice, you can make up to four mistakes. And so here are three examples across those top three um, assessment levels, right? This student got everything right on the first shot. Um, so they got an E, this student made three mistakes and then this student made um, their four mistakes. So, you know, they got their respective um, P's or N's. And so it's up to these two students now to decide what it is that they want to do. Do they want to reassess or do they want to stick with the grade that they got? And this was one of the things that I like about this is because now I'm sort of really turning the learning back into to your hands, right? You decide what you want to do um, at this point. And so that's sort of what the class looks like. That's the structure. And so now, so what happened after I implemented this, this result? I actually love my office hours now. I really do. Um, because now my office hours are centered in student learning. That's where we sit and that's where we stay. It's all about student learning, right? 
Um, we see much more spontaneous group work collaboration in my class, which has been pretty cool to see. Um, and no one asked me about points anymore. So that makes me happy. Um, we also see some um, positive impacts on how students feel about their learning. So like many of you, um, we have course evaluations at the end and ours are broken into these two main tiers, um, student learning themselves, how they feel about it, and then the learning environment itself. And so um, the biggest change that we saw was that because we changed the assessment method, students now value, it seems, more how we deliver the content, which was not what I was expecting at all. Um, and so that was pretty, pretty surprising to me. But also, we see these also internalizations of how they are improving or thinking about their learning as well. And so we see this not just in the numerical um, context of their student evaluations, because these are great, these are marked, you know, one through five, one being the worst, five being the best. But we also see it in their written comments, right? So before, this is my before mastery um, life, a lot of these comments were rooted in, you know, my personality, like he's a pretty dope dude, he's really patient, um, I make an effort, but the class is hard. But these comments didn't really center on students and their learning. But now we see students actually write about their learning and the development of their learning in the class, which has been pretty cool, right? This class taught me how to really study. It brought out my true work ethic and drive for success. This class made me a better student. I never got comments like these um, before. And I, the only thing I said, again, that we changed was how we assessed for the learning um, of our students. So that was pretty cool. The other thing that I saw from this approach was it really allows me to see where those trouble spots are in my class um, in any given term. And we know as educators, right, like, oh, this is gonna be a trouble spot for our students, but we can really see it here. And I also can show this to the students so the students know, yo, like we all really struggled on this one at first, but look, by the third reassessment, we are all pretty much either experts or proficient at this particular skill. And then there are some where, yo, right out the gate, we are pretty good at this particular idea or this particular skill. And so we can show this to the students to help them understand that they are all in this together. And we also think that showing this to them helps them come together um, as a class as well. And then lastly, um, the one that makes me, I guess, the happiest is that we've been able to close this gap between my uh, students of color in the class and, and my majority students, right? So now, um, as we've implemented this, this approach, right, we can see that our students of color, it, they are now basically equally likely to either earn an A or a C in my class. We're still trying to figure out why the distribution is sort of this bimodal distribution, um, but I'll take it as, a, as, a, as an initial run, right? And then what we see in our majority students, interestingly, is that now they are more distributed evenly across all of the grade ranges. And I think this is because for a lot of our majority students, um, they sort of understand sort of those unwritten rules about how you get those points back or how you navigate those kinds of things to move you from the C to the B range. And so I think that's why things are now normalized across um, all of the grade levels. We've also seen um, a 60% decrease in course withdrawals um, after we implemented this method. Um, and it's interesting that when you look at the students that do withdraw from this course, now I'm not sure why this is, but it's my majority students now that are withdrawing at larger rates than my students of color. So we're trying to think through that as well. But also again, as an indicator of closing the gap, I use the same final exam year over year and so we see a 16.5% decrease in our standard deviation from our pre and post um, mastery um, approaches to this, to this course. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'm really happy about this. And so this is the first time we did it. We do have data for two subsequent years, but I couldn't get a hold of the true demographic data for my class for my director of institutional research. But instinctively, if I just color code everything, we're seeing sort of the same trends. And so if those are exciting things for you, I promise that making the switch is not that hard. I think the first place that you really got to start is with your um, learning targets. 
And what I'd say here is really just think about those concepts that you want your students to learn. And then what are the demonstrable actions that you need the student to um, show you to let you know that they have mastered this particular skill. And so the, one of the ways that I approached this was what were the things if I were grading for points that I would take off points for, right? So here is that um, assessment from before. These are all of the things that I would take off points for if I were grading for points, right? And so if those are the things that I would take off points for, these are the things that you've got to be able to do correctly for me to say you've mastered this particular concept. And so I think that's step one, right, is thinking through your learning targets um, and framing them sort of in this demonstrable action um, idea. And then after you've done that, one of the other suggestions I would say is thinking about your content. For me here, for all of the organic chemists in the room, um, here are all of the reactions as an example for alkenes, right? We talk about these usually as, as a part of one chapter, and then we might give you an exam after we close that chapter, and we maybe cherry pick some of these to actually assess you on because it's too much to do them all at one time. And so what I've done is I've broken them into smaller bite-sized chunks, and I've also reorganized the content a bit. So if you see here, um, the organic chemists will recognize that I've really grouped these now mechanistically instead of by functional group. And then they're in smaller chunks, like this is an assessment, this is an assessment. So now if I'm gonna ask you to learn about all of these things, I should also assess you on all of these things. And I can do that um, in this format as well. And so those are the first two steps. And I think they're the hardest, but they're actually not as hard as you think once you sort of begin to work through it. And then after you've done that, the rest of it is basically what we've all done before as faculty members, right? We provide the learning opportunities and the stuff that we do in class. We assess, we now provide them with those assessments. I just took my old quizzes and exams and reframed them in terms of number of mistakes that you would make. Um, and then we sort of see how things go and we make adjustments. And that's sort of how I went about this um, project or idea of redesigning my course in the mastery based way. Um, and so that was sort of the lightning round. Um, it, hopefully there were some questions in there. And with that, I'll thank you for coming to see what we've been doing. And I'll take um, any questions that you got. I will, oh, let me stop my sharing. There we go, there we go. Is that it? Boop, 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 boop. All right, uh-oh. All right, so, so one of the questions that we see is how long does it take to grade an assessment and then regrade them? So I, so my class is at 815. So the students take their assessments at 815 and on the initial assessment, um, it's back to them with by 11 o'clock in the morning that day. So they get their assessments back same day and then regrading their assessments, I've broken them up into chunks so that they're not taking all 19 every, every reassessment period, right? So they'll take, you know, maybe five or six at a time. And that takes me no longer than it would if I were gonna grade an exam. And it's quick too, because I'm just counting for mistakes, right? Like that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And you're done. I'm not like, oh, this is a half a point mistake. So it's actually much faster um, than you think it is. So I, my grading time is actually reduced. Um, I see when and how do I do the reassessment? So um, I used to do my reassessments outside of class, but um, I've gotten away from that. And now what I do is I take the three class periods that would normally have been allocated for um, an exam. I take those exam days and those are now my reassessment days. So I haven't lost any class time um, in doing that as well. So that, that, is this lecture and lab? Yeah, it is a lecture and lab class, um, but we've recently decoupled the lab from the lecture in this course. Um, and our labs are also mastery based as well. So we've done some mastery things in lab as well. 
why 19 assessments and not some other number? Is it based? Yes, it's based on the number of learning objectives that I have in the class. So I've broken up the concepts that are critical for organic in my case. Um, and in this class, it's, it's 19. Do you do initial assessments online or during class time? So pre-COVID, I did them in class and they're all 15 minutes. Post COVID, we are we're doing them online, but synchronous synchronously, and that they download it on from our LMS, and then they have um, a Wacom board, and they fill it out on the PDF, and then they upload it. So it's open, um, you know, for a set period of time, like thirty minutes, um, and then they they'll do it that way. Um. Were your tests also done without points? How do you combine the holistic grading with points based to get a letter grade in the end? So in the end, right? So I have 19 total assessments. And so their grade is dependent upon the number of E's, P's and N's that they get. So as an example, if there are 19 total assessments, um, I would say that they got to get an E on 17 of them in order to get an A. If they want to be, they'd have to get any combination of E's or P's, right? And then we sort of prorate it um, that way. Um, the example was for molecular diagrams, but do you do these assessments for short answer questions? If that's even a thing in OCAM, OCAM. Yes, there, I do do short answers. So there are questions that I ask like, this reaction takes 10 minutes. This reaction takes 10 seconds. Explain, right? And so in those, you've got to give me the exact explanation. And usually I limit it by word count. So I'll say in no more than 20 words, tell me why the rate is different. So I do do short answers um, and they just have to give me the, the correct reasoning that way. So I can do that as well. Uh, could you speak more about how you use the final exam? Sure. So the final exam is points based. It's the same exam that I've been using all of my time at K. And so I grade it based on, on points. So every mistake is basically a point lost, right? And so then um, after we total the percentage of your final exam, if your base grade based on the number of E's, P's and N's that you get was an A, if you got a 50, or you know, a 49 on the final exam, you'd end up with a B, right? Because that lets me know that there's been some loss of learning for you um, throughout the term. So you have to have mastered it and retained that mastery throughout the course of the term. Um, how much class time do I give for each of the 19 initial assessments? I give them 15 minutes per assessment, unless it's one that I think is a little bit trickier and then maybe I'll give them 20, right? So, but no more than 20 minutes. And so my classes are an hour and 15 minutes. So every class we have um, at least an hour on average to do all of the other stuff that we gotta do in the class. Will my slides be available? I think so. Um, because I, I'm pretty sure that Course Hero is recording all of the talks. Um, and so you can see them either as a recording or I think I'm supposed to upload them at some point as well. Is there only one proctored activity, the final exam? Well, the assessments are proctored and as the assessments are proctored. So I, I watch you do those if we're doing them in class. And, but in terms of the online environment, they're proctored in the sense that you only have you know, still 15 to 20 minutes and you don't, and for my assessments, you don't have enough time, you know, to ask somebody to help you do this. I mean, I guess you could have somebody else do it for you, but in the end, you know, that means you'll tank the final exam. So there's, there's that. Any, anything else? Did I miss anything? I'm, I'm hopeful that this was helpful um, to you all. I mean, it's pretty cool. If you want to send me an email, you can send me an email. It's my first name, Dwight.Williams at kzoo.edu. Um, and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, there's tons of information out there. I am by mo no means the first person to do this, um, but I think it's worked out really well for us. And I'll never go back to, to the old way of doing things.
Cool, you're using it in physiology. I can't wait to hear about your results. Did I miss anything? All right, you all are very, very welcome. All right. Did I miss anything? How do I do assessments online? So I upload them to our LMS. And then the students can download, I, it, so we use Moodle, so I upload it as an assignment in Moodle, and then the students can download it, and then they use their tablet um, to draw on their PDF, and then they upload that back to Moodle, and then I grade it. So they draw on it using like Notability or any other PDF editor, um, and then they upload it back to Moodle, and then I grade them that way. Does this help? Oh, yes. The anxiety level in my class is almost non-existent by the end of the course, right? So at first, students come to us trained to think they got to be perfect at the beginning. And so this method, I think, also helps them understand that learning is a process and that they don't have to be perfect on the outset. But you do have to sort of retrain them to think like it's okay for me to mess up the first time. And so halfway through the term, you can see the anxiety like, oh, I can redo this and I can learn it. It's, so yes, the anxiety definitely does go down. So all of your students have a tablet. So you can use a tablet, you can use a Wacom board, you can use your mouse, anything that lets you draw on the PDF. The title of those three books. Let's see. Sure. Share. Uh, ah, I missed it. There we go. There they are. If that helps, you can take a quick screenshot. Do some students get really behind because they take longer to learn each topic? Uh, some students do, but that's my responsibility to help you catch up, right? So um, those are the students that we just have longer office hours with. We work with you to get that done. Um, so yeah, some students do get behind, but it's mostly because they, they fall into this trap where, oh, I can take it again, so let me not study the first time. And then they quickly realize like, yo, I really don't want to have to take eight of these things on reassessment day, right? So, so yeah. Which book did I find the most helpful? I've, I think the, the specifications grading book um, by Nielsen was the most helpful. Oh yeah. So I guess, yeah, oh yeah, see, I'm over my time. So I guess I gotta, I gotta say goodbye to, to everyone. But you can send me an email and I'll answer back as soon as I can. <laughs>